It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Thursday, March 1st, 2012. I am James Burns. We are joined now by Bob Chapman. His website is theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, how are you doing today, sir? Well, pretty good. Excellent. First off, I want to go ahead and get to it with uh, the latest economic and, of course, the uh, news coming out of the European Union. We get lots of conflicting stories coming out of the European Union. There's a meeting today. I guess it's over by now. It was a secret meeting on how they're going to do this uh, debt settlement, bailout, or whatever you want to call it with Greece. And um, I'm not optimistic as to what they're going to come out with. They continue to change the rules. Um, it's just like somebody being in a race and they keep on raising the bar. In this last week, all these negative comments out of Germany by members of the Christian Democratic Union and they're regarding whether Greece should be at all in the uh, Eurozone. Well, you know, they knew exactly what was going on eight, nine years ago, particularly Germany. And what was going on was they brought Goldman Sachs in to create derivatives to make it seem like both Italy and Greece qualified. Well, everybody knew they didn't. But they wanted to have that union including them, and I certainly couldn't have done it without Italy. And this is how this problem started in the first place. Neither of them should have ever been admitted. And you can't say they didn't know about it because they did. I wrote extensively about it and about one interest rate fits all, which was the pull the plug disaster uh, that turned this whole thing upside down, so to speak. Anyway, I don't know exactly how this is going to turn out in the short term. There's no question they want to commandeer Greece as 111 tons of gold, and so they can throw it in the market and keep the price down like they did with the Libyan gold. Of course, we can't prove that, but they are so un inartful when they do things that it's easy to recognize for a trader or somebody who's been in gold and silver as a professional for many years. You just dump it. They don't care. And um, and so that's what they would like to do with the Greek gold and probably everybody else is that they could get a hold of it. But I don't see that happening. I know it's part of the agreement that is in the process of being finalized because you got an election coming up now in four or five weeks, probably four weeks. And the big question is, uh, are they going to have it on April 3rd? And if they do, will Mr. Samaras and the Free Democratic Party win? And I think, yes, he will. And there's going to be changes. And one of them is going to be, you're not going to keep that goal. And at the same time, there'll be many other changes. And, you know, the defiance here of anything moral is beyond belief. Now, these people just want to loot the country. And they've been after that from the very good beginning. I got a very nice letter today from a subscriber who is 41, 42 years old. And uh, eminent background, a Greek. And he talks about how his grandfather told him about how he gets shot behind his right ear, and uh, but it didn't penetrate. And uh, he described how he got his wound from the Germans. And these people are not going to lay down and allow the European bankers to dismantle their country, their civilization, their culture. They're not going to do it. And uh, there is nothing that's going to work unless they want it to. Uh, people are covering, you know, these are professional 
government employees are covering up the uh, parking meters on the street, uh, the meters in the subway, uh, the collection point at the at the toll roads, uh, people who own businesses who will not collect VAT. Uh, there's a silent revolution going on, and uh, it's like we want to be free. We want our country back. And so no matter which way you come at this, once that submissive party is out of power, which was run by a father, a, a man, who was a crook, and his father was the biggest crook in Greek history, um, under the Spop and Bale. And, uh, and, of course, uh, George is now gone. He, he was replaced by a, a appointee of the Illuminati. And they did the same thing at the European Central Bank, and they did the same thing as the president of Italy as well. These are all top Illuminati people, and they just changed everything by flooding everything with the money. $1.367 trillion between the two tranches, one on the 29th and the other one the third week of December. And they're going to keep right on doing that. They don't care. All they're doing is depriving anybody who has to use euros of the value of their euro by depreciating it. And, of course, the money originally came from the Federal Reserve. They've created out of thin air. They said it was a currency swap and it was a loan. They lied. I mean, Ron Paul in Congress in the House yesterday told Mr. Bernanke he was a liar. I mean, how bad does it get? I mean, does it have to be etu brusis? I mean, does Caesar have to be murdered? This is what this is all coming down to. You get people mad enough, you got to get a reaction. And if these people think the military is going to come to their aid, they're crazy. And so there's no solution yet. Well, the, the people in Greece are plenty mad right now, Bob. I mean, they've been protesting this for the past couple of years, and and it's it's a good thing that they are finally ousting this this terrible regime that's been running things and basically, well, running uh, Greece into the ground and handing it over to the IMF and uh you know it's their cohorts. Uh, Bob, I mean, you just mentioned something about the possibility of you know we don't know what the solution is going to be, if they get enough people in the uh, Greek Parliament to uh, take over, you know, and what what would be the best course of action for the people of Greece to do? Would to possibly maybe leave the European Union? They have no choice. They have never had a choice. They have to use, uh, leave the Eurozone, the 17 countries out of 27 that belong to the European Union. They have to go back to the drachma, default in total, tell them they're not going to take their gold or anything else. And tell them if you want war, send your troops in. We'll have lots of Greeks coming here from all over the world. I don't think the EU wants that. The bankers don't want that. And so I believe they've got to clean up their mess. And the mess was created by the politicians and the bankers by giving them money whenever the politicians ask for it. You know, they give them, you know, a billion dollars and uh, the politicians uh, steal 60, 70 percent of it. I don't know what their ratio is, but it's pretty high. When people say, oh, we're not going to pay for it. We didn't know what they were doing. Well, it's true. We get the banks, stocks rallying in Europe. We've got the bonds rallying. Who's kidding who? That's not going to solve the problem. Almost $1.4 trillion. Imagine, there's 800 banks in Europe that borrowed that money. I didn't know there were that many bankrupt banks in Europe. Very revealing. And they're all running around like gorillas beating their chests. Ah, oh, we got all the money we need. What do we care what everybody else does? This will carry us for another year and a half, two years. And we can impose upon the people of Europe all kinds of horrible new laws. And that's what they're up to. And it's going to affect every market in the world negatively. <coughs> because everybody more or less deals in euros. They have to if they're doing business. <coughs> and so there is no solution yet. And it's not good. You know, the bank stocks might look beautiful. J.P. Morgan Chase. Goldman Sachs, up five points today. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. I don't think so. 
You know, one of the things that uh, I got some research on today was the um, cost of doing business in Europe among countries that are supposed to be in good shape. Inflation is 25% higher in France than it is in Germany. And if you go to the restaurant, you know, let's say you pay $75 for meals for two, and in France you pay 100 And in Germany, they the food's better, and they give you more. And if you're overweight, that's important. I believe we got Bob Chapman back on the line. The Internet, unfortunately, uh, crashed on me, Bob, my wonderful high-speed cable Internet. <laughs> but I'm glad to have you back on the show. Um, we were uh, talking about the uh, situation in the European Union, and we talked a lot about uh, Greece a moment ago. Uh, what country in, Gre- in uh, the European Union, Bob, do you think is going to be next on their list? Well, I think because of the political sellout by the previous party and the ongoing demands of the present party in Ireland, I think they're next. They assume the debt of the Alpha Group, which owned the banks in Ireland, still do. Now, I've never before in history heard of a population saying, well, you people invested and you lost lots of money, uh, but we're going to make it a law here that we're going to assume your debt. Well, I've never heard anything so crazy in my life. But that's with those people in the party that was just kicked out of office several months ago. That's what they did. They've been in power since 1936. You know, it's no wonder you know, they have an IRA. And um, I know lots about that. Anyway, I think Ireland's the next one, followed by Portugal. And the next one with real problems will be Belgium. But uh, all the money that's available through the European Central Bank, the $1.4 trillion, I'm rounding it out to make it easy, rather than go from 1.347 or whatever the heck it is. We'll call it 1.4. And who knows what else they gave them, lent them, that we'll never see again that we'll pay for. Because if you saw the testimony in the House to yesterday, you saw Ron Paul tell the head of the Fed Reserve, Mr. Bernanke, that he was a liar. I don't think that's ever happened in the House before. Maybe it has. But I've never seen it in my lifetime, nor can I remember it. It's very, very significant. Because we get the same thing going on in Europe. Right now, the head of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, eminent member of the Illuminati. Now, what is this guy doing? Well, he's telling everybody that he's not buying bonds in the marketplace. He he said they stopped doing that. We are proof that they're still doing it. They were buying up Portugal's 10-year bonds, which fell to half of face value. And he, through the ECB, went in and stopped the bloodletting, so to speak. Eventually, just like at the Fed, all of this bad debt that's being held for the European Central Bank will be paid off by the public. Unless, of course, the European Central Bank uh, and the Eurozone breaks up, that will be another matter. But uh, that's the way all this is headed. And I think Germany finally realizes this. I, I told uh, people in uh, politics in Germany two and a half years ago, I mean, this is a way to go. This is how you do it. There's no way you can retrieve it. Uh, nothing's going to happen. It's going to make it any better. You knew what was going on. So bite the bullet and get rid of them. Of course, the other two will fall, and they'll be happy about that. They'll pay them to get out. But that doesn't mean it's going to continue to function in the Eurozone with uh, 14 members instead of 17, because most of them are minor players. 40% of the action in in the European Union is done by Germany. Action being buying and selling and business and all that sort of thing. And uh, does something like Slovenia or Belgium make a difference? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, even in Belgium, they they can't even elect a government. I mean, in the last three years, they had a government, I think, for about nine months. I'm probably incorrect on that, but I'm close. And uh, before that, for about two or three years, they had no government. Why? The country was balkanized. 
For those of you who don't know that what that is, half of it are French-speaking Walloons in the South, and in the North, they have another group of people who speak, oh gosh, I can't think of it. I spent a lot of time in that country, too. Sometimes I get mental blocks. We got Bob Chapman back up on the line after uh, the Internet crashed again. It's a wonderful day here in the neighborhood. And, Bob, uh, where we left off was you were discussing the balkanization of Belgium between uh, two different groups of people. You had the uh, French-speaking Belgians in the south, and then you had another group of people in the north as part of the uh, issue for why Belgium has such trouble trying to form any form of government. Yeah, in addition to that, um, they allow um, government-sponsored and sanctioned uh, discrimination. They have areas that uh, one group only can live in and the other can't. Now they do break the rules and um, and people do from one group live with others. But generally speaking, they don't. And uh, most people don't know that. I live there, I know. In fact, the first time I went there was 1958 to the World's Fair. And... Um, it was very nice and an exciting adventure. My question, Bob, is if they have such a, a different, like, point of view and culture from the north to the south, why don't they just simply divide up Belgium from, like, make it north Belgium, south Belgium, and allow them to have their own governments? <laughs> because it's been done deliberately. Uh, the British were masters at this, and were the French, too. And... If you remember, the word Balkan comes from Eastern Europe. They used to call it the Balkans. They did the same thing uh, there. Uh, split countries up uh, between two and three different ethnic groups, which had previously been separate. And they do that so they can create wars. They've been doing it since the 15th century. So There's nothing new. But all the people who haven't read history... Uh, they don't know. They don't care. I'm trying to think of them, what that name of the people in the north are. I'm, maybe someone will email you and tell you. It's embarrassing. But anyway, um, uh, they're on the possible list that probably will be saved uh, because the EU has all of their apparatus there. And so... Uh, the two big problems are Spain and Italy, and that's what they're saving their ammunition for. Four trillion dollars to bail out the two of them. It's about, I guess, 2.5 and 1.5 trillion each for a total of four. And I told the Germans this, uh, I don't know, three years ago. There's no way they can pay this back. So you've got to go pay it if you want world government socialist paradise that you want. You know, you know I, I was writing about this today for Saturday. You know, nobody ever, and I haven't seen anybody yet, return, uh, re refer to one of the underlying tenets of the problems here. It's called socialism. Get as much out of the system as you can without giving as much as you have to. And it's a disaster. Even in Germany. And uh, it's, it's a good part of the problem. And these people like this cradle-to-grave stuff. And uh, hysterically, unfortunately, it doesn't work. So I don't know what they're going to do, but it's going to be painful no matter what it is. Yeah, it just looks like an overall very, very bad situation for the people of Europe. And, I mean, it's sad, but, you know, it's inevitable. And I think sooner or later it's going to all come crashing down on them. And the best they can hope for is that they have at least enough left to where they can, you know, go back to, you know, being sovereign, independent countries and start over. Well, that's essentially what's got to happen. And uh, they don't know that. The bankers do. But the bankers run things, and they're not going to tell them about it. And so we're going to continue to see a befuddling actions by alumnus who take their orders from London and Washington. <laughs> Excuse me. And they're going to continue to do what they've been doing, and that is creating money out of thin air 
and plastering it all over the European, British, and U.S. economies. No, it's not going to work. And they know that. They're not dumb people we're dealing with here. So there's no place else for them to escape from this. So they're going to play it out till the end and then have a war. Only this time, they have a war. It's like it will be the last war. And uh, that's what uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski has been talking about for the last three or four years, as well as um, just recently, Mr. Putin, who is running again for the presidency in Russia, and uh, he told him, you have a war, and you don't even want to know what it's going to be like. Not at all, because right now you have Russia and China on one side. They're very much against the uh, shenanigans that the West has been involved in in the Middle East over the past decade alone, and especially with what happened in Libya and now with uh, us threatening to do the same exact thing in Syria, plus the war drums con- continuing to beat for Iran. Like, Russia and, and China are just, you know, they're, they've been fed up. I mean, they also have investments in these countries, and there's, you know, legitimate reasons why they want Syria to be left intact. They each have their own motivations, but at the same time, I think it's just the the reality of the situation is they've they've had enough. And you're right. They don't want war. Peace is another better way to go. But the United States, for a long, 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 long time, has been an aggressor nation, planning and executing wars to loot people. I guess that's what the best way to do it. Call it. And so that's been their modus operandi for, I don't know, 150 years, and it's worked for them. Well, I think the world is getting sick of it, and the Americans are getting sick of it as well. People send their children off to defend their country to find out it's only for the military-industrial complex and Wall Street and banking so they can get richer than they already are. And they couldn't uh, spend their wealth in 20 or 50 or 100 lifetimes. And this is what we're dealing with here. You're absolutely right about that. I mean, it's just sad if you look back at our history and you take off the rose-colored glasses. I mean, we have this this addiction to war. I mean, you look at the Mexican-American War, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, the war in the Philippines, then World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I can only imagine how fed up most of the people in the world are getting right now because, I mean, we've gotten way worse in the past couple of years, especially with the fall of the Soviet Union. As you uh, reflect back, you can see those things uh, if you look to, at them straight on with reality. You know, they, tell, talk, uh, they call it doom and gloom. It's just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. It's as simple as that. And the United States government has got to be stopped. They're maniacal, out of control, Satanists good overall term to them. And uh, as long as we allow them to get away with it, they're going to do it. And so how do you stop them? Let the banking system collapse and they lose their source of power. Pretty simple. It's all you have to do. You're right about that, Bob. And Ron Paul was pretty spot on You know, when he had his little confrontation with Ben Bernanke. You, you touched up on this a little bit a moment ago. How, you know, Ron Paul said, you know, it doesn't really matter if we audit or in the Fed. Sooner or later, it's going to collapse in on itself. That's right. And Bernanke just sits there coldly and says, uh, well, those, uh, those are statistics from the Bureau lay the statistics. We believe they do a good job, you know, trying to inform people. And uh, that's not true, and he knows it. But this man is uh, a lie a minute. He reminds me of a salesman. Yeah can't stop selling. And so, you know, that's what we're faced with. Characters who don't care, and if they lie on radio or television or in statements, uh, they don't care. They own the system. You don't. They're going to do what they want. They're going to steal everything you've got and put you in one of those internment camps. That's your plan. Ask them. They'll tell you that. Because they don't care what you think. No, they don't. And it's very similar to you know what happened uh, in the the last days of the French monarchy under Louis the Sixteenth. You know the the plebs were rising up against them. They were ticked off about you know this, you know the corruption and the you know the king and the queen you know and the you know their you know loyalists you know robbing the people blind and you know they just said hey we'll just eat cake but 
as you've pointed out time and time again, Bob, you know, we know exactly what happened to them <laughs> sooner or later. You know, these people are going to get the guillotine as well. Well, um, 30,000 people lost their heads, and not all of them were guilty. How many, I don't know. But they wanted to decimate the entire commercial class, not only the, uh, the monarchy. The monarchy was obvious. Uh, but they wanted to get rid of the competition. And you never hear any stories about how many people from Celtic Western France had their heads cut off and didn't do anything. But there's always excesses in every revolution. And, uh, you know, these additional casualties who just happen to be in the way. And uh, Flemish, that's the word I'm looking for. In the north of Belgium, they're called Flemish. Well, that's... Anyway, I... I, 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 I uh, finished that point, so to speak. Yeah, and it's the sad truth, Bob, when it comes to any revolution, whether it's a, a good revolution, which are very rare, unfortunately, or a nasty revolution, which leads to something far worse. There's always the, the people in the middle, the innocent, that end up being caught in the crosshairs. And you see the same thing in wars and occupations and all these police state actions that have been happening over the past decade alone. I mean, such as what's happened in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, and now in Syria. I mean, it's always the innocent people who didn't do anything to anybody, who are just trying to, you know, make a living and, you know, provide for their family and just, you know, make it from day to day. They're the ones who end up being the, the real victims. Well, that's true. And waiting in the wings are the transnational corporations who are going to help you. We are here to help you. Right now in Somalia, they're going to strike their first oil well sputter today or tomorrow. And they're going to make a deal with BP, British Petroleum. And when the dictator or whatever he is there uh, is asked about that, he says, well, you know, we, we don't have the expertise. We had to bring somebody in. And of course, that's not true. You're going to end up with nothing. The Brits will take it all. Yeah, because, you know, BP, as you and I both know, Bob, has a history of treating their, uh, you know, the people who uh, they uh, drill in, the countries and uh, offshore, they have a really nice history of treating people right. I mean, just ask the people of the, uh, the uh, southern coast of the United States. Tragedy. They get away with it. Money buys everything. There's always somebody there with a hand out. And that's human nature, and that's society, and uh, there's not much we can do about it, except when we catch them, put them in jail where they should be, but we don't always catch them. Man, it's especially difficult to catch them when they, they buy off the leaders of countries, and they buy off the, the governments, and they put their own people within government, actually, and they even end up buying off the court system. So it, they get away with almost anything, and as you've pointed out time and time again, you know, all these different groups like Goldman Sachs that – do get in trouble with the SEC. You know, they just put on a little show trial and they make them basically just take a slap on the wrist. When you're seeing that right now, <clears throat> the SEC has sent a Wells letter, which means we want to talk to you, to um, Goldman Sachs. Um, the reason they got the letter is so that if the SEC sees anything civil, they can pursue it. Now, the events happened six years ago. And evidently, and from a civil viewpoint, uh, the civil viewpoint, um, it was the only way to go that was left. You question now, why didn't they uh, do something about this six years ago? Well, because what they did was criminal. And probably the statute of limitations is expired. And they, you know, they make a clear-cut case in the in the media that oh, this is not criminal, this is civil. They made a mistake. It's the same excuse used by the Raiders, S and P and Moody's and so on. They went to court. Somebody brought them to court over those uh, toxic bonds. And the judge says, I, I, I can't find against them because they did what they thought was the right thing. And I can't tell you find anything that they can be blamed for. And, of course, that's untrue. 
because those people are part of the people who own the system. Exactly. And I, I guess a, a bank robber couldn't use that same defense. Oh, oh, I, I thought I was doing the right thing by holding up that bank for a couple thousand dollars. Oh, are, are you sure it's criminal? I thought it was civil. I, I don't think that would fly too well. Well, that's the way it is in America. And um, it's probably not going to get any better. It's probably going to get worse and unless we can elect somebody like Ron Paul. And if we don't do that, then we'll probably have a revolution like many other countries have had and will have. So that's what you can expect from not paying attention. And that's my, my fear right there, Bob, is that if we don't get Ron Paul the GOP nomination, if we don't, you know, if he doesn't win the White House and become the 45th president, it's very obvious. The ball is just going to keep rolling in the same direction. And it doesn't matter if it's Obama for another four years or Romney or Gingrich or Santorum. They're just going to, you know, keep the truck going. And do you think that it's – do you think that our best chance for turning things around in this primary could very well happen on Super Tuesday? Or do you think there's probably going to be more voter fraud and shenanigans? There'll be more shenanigans. I'm not sure that Ron Paul doesn't win or come close to it. And Ohio's got a terrible record of, of uh, rigging elections. And they'll do it again. They don't care. Now that's a I mean, they've already demonstrated that in the previous uh, uh, preliminary uh, elections. They stole them all. I mean, it's proof of it. It's a fraud. It's criminal. But nobody goes to, to jail. I mean, we may not even have any laws. And they make the laws up as they, as they go along. Yeah, it's just, it's just insane that, you know, I mean, I realize that election fraud is nothing new. As long as there's been, you know, the idea of a democracy or an election-based uh, form of government. But I have to believe that there was a time when there was a lot more honest voting going on than the dishonest type as you know, is made famous throughout Chicago land over the past couple of decades. But it, it seems like it's it's very rare, Bob, to find any form of elections across any level of, of the government, whether it's at the the federal level, the state or local levels. It all seems to be corrupt and, you know, bought and paid for and taken care of behind the scenes before anyone even casts a single vote. That's true. That's why sometimes people get set up. And they elect dictators who they don't even agree with just to get the people who are in office out. Yeah, it really does come down to the devil, you know. And that's my fear because I've been looking at the candidates, you know, very hard. You know, the ones, the ones that we obviously don't really like too much, like Obama, Santorum, Gingrich, and Romney. And I, I see Romney and I see uh, Romney and uh, Obama about the same level of scary, about basically almost carbon copies of each other with a few exceptions. But then I take a look at Santorum and Gingrich and imagine what we would be like under their regimes. And it really does go back to devil you know. I mean, I'd rather have Obama another four years than a President Gingrich or a President Santorum. Well, you're not going to get anything positive out of it, no matter which way you cut it. They own the system. We've been, we've been shown again that that is the case. And... Um, you have your choices. No, we don't really have much of a choice, unfortunately. It's sad because, you know, it's, it's only going to lead – and you and I both know that this is what they want. They want a violent revolution in, their country, in this country. They want an excuse to clamp down. They want an excuse to, to you know, push the button on this police state control grid they've been building for the past decade alone. They want that. They, they want us to be shooting at each other. They want, you know, us to be shooting at troops and s police and vice versa. And – that's something that most of us are completely against because we understand that. We want a peaceful restoration of our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, and freedom and liberty in this country. And they're basically doing their best to slam every single door in front of us. And that's true. Now, Bob, in your, in your opinion, because it, it does seem very apparent that they're, they're going to pull one over on Ron Paul and we're going to end up, you know, continuation of what we've had for too long now. What should the people do, in your opinion? As, as to keep things going, what, what would be the best case scenario for us to continue this movement in the cause of liberty and freedom, even without Ron Paul winning the election? Well, I think working at local level is probably the most effective and easiest to penetrate. And not that there's no crooks there, and 
Well, the South Africa is uh, no people and it will go along with the federal government and those who control it. But you stand, you stand a better shot. I mean, your Congress doesn't even listen to you. Period. I mean, that's it. Yeah. And I try they it. Absolutely. Yeah. They don't listen at all, the, the Congress critters. It's, they no longer represent we the people. They represent, you know, whoever fills up their campaign war chests. And you're right, Bob. I think that the best way for us to press forward is to focus locally because we all focus on our own local uh, towns, cities, counties, parishes, and regions. I think that it could cause a massive ripple effect and eventually lead towards some positive change in this country. we got about a minute left, Bob. How can people get the International Forecaster? Well, the Forecaster is about business, finance, economic, social, and political issues all over the world. Uh, we publish on Wednesdays and Saturdays uh, by email. Runs about uh, 35, 40 pages each time. We have a hard copy that goes out twice a month for those who are not on the Internet. And everything you need to know each week is in that publication. You can get a free introductory copy by going to theinternationalforecaster.com. Theinternationalforecaster.com. Or you can go to www.intforecaster.com, intforecaster.com. So those of you who'd like to ask a question, let me answer everyone. Or get a copy of the publication or get a copy of our latest uh, our report on gold and silver shares. You can email us and that address is bob, B-O-B, at I-N-T, F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R dot com. Bob at intforecaster.com. And for those of you who would like to or have to, here's a toll-free number. It's 877-479-8178. That's 877-479-8178. And you can get copies of the publication there. And for those of, you who want to, uh, those of you who want to become subscribers, that's a great place to go to because they have a special. And that special would allow you to be a one-year subscriber for free. And so look into that if you want to be a subscriber. It's a deal, sir. It absolutely is. Bob, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I will talk to you next week, sir. Got it. Bye-bye.